they're helping uh, every single Jew to understand the connection between our souls and the, the, the and Eretz Yisrael, the, the Jewish soul and Eretz Yisrael are one. It's our Emma, it's our, it's our mother, and uh, the, a mother longs for its children. So, do we have Alon there? Yes, good morning. Yes. Oh. <laughs> I'm so happy to hear your voice. Hello, <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just thinking uh, that, that you would have another snowden day this morning, but Baruch Hashem. No, Baruch Hashem. We don't get much snow often in Tzfat, but we do get uh, harsh winter weather here. Yeah. Sure. So that's what you had yesterday. Yes, the last uh, couple of days we had a very stormy weather. Mm. And I thought the winter was over last week when we had a beautiful week. But I guess we have a few more weeks of, uh, of some, uh, some uh, winter weather. Yes, so some surprises. And I was just thinking when, I was just telling the listeners, I don't know if you heard, that um, when I, I think I connected with you like three, three this morning, that uh, I was so happy to, to connect with you, uh, but also that you mu it must have been actually quite peaceful without all the technology. Uh, yes, I'm very... <laughs> <laughs> I'm, even though I use technology to spread Hashem's word, I mm. always like not being connected to technology. People don't understand how I don't walk around with a phone. Yes. I, 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 I don't like the whole thing. And mm -hmm. people sometimes, they, they look at me like, what? <laughs> You're not walking around with your phone? <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it takes me a couple of hours to reply an email. The people get upset mm -hmm. that I don't walk around with a phone, with a, with a radiating piece of metal attached to my body <laughs> in, in, order, in order to answer an email. <laughs> I, I, I think that's a very, very healthy... Um, stance to take. Yes, I think it's a very big addiction in our generation, not to talk about Yetzel Hara, is all the technology being attached to us, like as if it's my baby. Yes. So, exactly. yes. it's unbelievable how I see people addicted to a piece of metal all day long, they're checking emails and texts and pictures and... <laughs> Yep. Crazy a lot. Let's just do a quick break and then we're going to go straight into the topic of Eretz Yisrael and the Jewish soul, how we connect it. Gladly. Yes. You've seen them on the History Channel and now they are on your radio. Shirley MacLaine. I met her when she came to some city many years ago. Yes, I'm not going to say your age, but she must be 100. On Wednesday, it seems to be hump day. Wednesday is not a humping day, it's a hump day, yes? Palm stars, South Africa. There's a lot of things saying about diamonds. Diamonds are forever. Diamonds are girl best friends. Diamonds are men worst enemy. <laughs> but you know that Chuck Norris cut an onion, the onion cries. You know that. <laughs> you know Chuck Norris once killed a man twice. Join Roy and his team for honest, irreverent, and entertaining radio every Wednesday at 6 p.m. From top to music, from Johannesburg to Israel, sport to business, this is 101.9 High FM. Uh, this budget speech is probably the most important in our history, not only for the rating, uh, ratings agency, but for each one of us as South Africans. The finance minister, Pravin Gordham, ha will deliver uh, his uh, budget speech, the 2016-2017 budget speech in Parliament on Wednesday, that's today, on Chai FM, and it will, bringing, it will be bringing it to you live this afternoon. So regular programming will fall away from the start of the budget speech at 2, and we cannot afford to miss, miss this budget. This is 101.9 Chai FM. 101.9 megahertz of dynamic business talk. And this is the Cabana Friedman, Body, Mind and Soul. And I have the absolute privilege of speaking to Rabbi Alon Anava. And we, let, let's get into the topic. We, um, we want to speak about Eret Israel and how the Jew is connected to, the, the soul of the Jew is connected to Eret Israel. Um, but before, uh, uh, won't you just share with the listeners some wonderful um, 
insights into your journey to Eretz Israel that your grandmother escaped at the age of 17 on uh, Crystal Nacht. Just areas of business, and he made it very, very big in in New York. Uh, Alon, are you there? Yes, I lost you for a second. Is Alon is Alon with us? Yes, can you hear me? You, yes, yes, okay. you're there. Yes, I lost so you. Been, sorry about that. Um, um, probably still a bit, a bit stormy. So I was just sharing a little bit with the listeners of uh, your, uh, what you told me of your, your grandmom's at the age of 17, how she escaped. They got information uh, just before Kristallnacht to, to run for their lives. Yes. Yes, I was actually thinking we we're going to touch that at the end, oh, okay. ma ma mainly because of the reason. No, no, it's it's fine. I just the the reason why I, I even then told you about that and why I think it's so important to share it with the listeners is because when it comes to talk about doing aliyah to Eretz Israel, uh, you know, a lot of people they they go they hibernate back into their little shell. Maybe I'm using the wrong terminology, but a lot of people, especially outside of the world, outside of Israel, you, you know, in the United States or South Africa, Australia, all the, the comfortable places, or so to say, you talk to them about Aliyah, they right away back up into their shell and like, no, 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 it's fine, right, it's fine where I am here. Mm, and it's hard in Israel, and it's hard... Yeah, there's all the excuses, uh, there's no jobs, there's no work, there's wars, there's threats. Yes. And I was lucky enough to do Aliyah half a year ago, which uh, was planned for a while. And there was a reason why I stayed so long in the United States, which we'll talk about that too if we have a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. But uh, when I, I, you know, the last 10 years I've, I've been on a, on a world tour spreading um, and sharing my story how I became religious. Mm -hmm. My main effort was to get people to understand that there's a creator to the world, that there's a, a, a eternal life after this world, and all the, the, the beauty of the Torah and mitzvahs, etc. Or in other words, getting people closer to God. But my secondary effort for so many years was to get, was to get people to go back to Israel. Whether it's Israelis who went away from Israel, or whether it was Jews that were born wherever they were. doesn't matter where they are, Europe, Australia, uh, uh, America. That was my secondary effort, constantly to get people to go to Israel, for many reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is because I know the, com the Mashiach is coming very soon, and it's time to, to physically start coming to Eretz Israel. We know that uh, there is... Uh, uh, can you hear me? Um. Can you hear me? Alone? Yeah, I'm yes, here. I can, I can hear you. Yes. Carry on. So, uh, we know that before the coming of the final Mashiach, who is called Mashiach ben David, the son of David, there's going to be a period of 70 years that is going to be ruled by the Mashiach called Mashiach ben Yosef. And at that time, one of the major things that's going to ha start happening is what's called Kibbutz Geluyot. Kibbutz Geluyot is gathering the, the people from exile. And physically we have to do it. It's not about waiting for the coming of Mashiach ben David, the, the Mashiach, the son of David, for him to do it. Rather, we have to start initiating it. Mm -hmm. And we see that the first breakthrough was it 1948 when Israel was uh, declared as a country and, and right on the spot, thousands of Jews started c coming to Israel and since then, every year, tens of thousands of Jews are coming to Israel and you see that, that physically the process of Kibbutz Geluyot, of gathering the, the people from the exile, is started. So, there's many reasons, hopefully we'll have time to cover that, but there's many reasons why everybody has to start doing Aliyah. Aliyah meaning going back to Eretz Israel, to our roots. We'll, if we have time, we'll talk about some biblical and uh, prophetic uh, details why we have to. But when a lot of people tell me, listen, you know, everything's good here, especially I now was, was living in the, in the United States for, for 17 years, and 
And any place that I went to, people were like, listen, you know, we're very comfortable here. And, you know, when you're talking about all these weird things, coming of Mashiach or some apocalyptic a prophecy that you read in the Torah, that there may, might be a world war or all these uh, horror stories that we're hearing hovering over our head, this planet that is coming closer to, to Earth, planet X, or as known as Nibiru, all these prophecies and information people when they hear that they're like oh no come on you know we've been hearing about it for thousands of years it's all nonsense mm -hmm. so when i get the answer of it's all nonsense or i don't believe or I i'll i'll do a move when something happens i always go back to our 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 uh, unfortunate history mm -hmm. and our history keeps repeating itself but very, very close to us, not too long ago, 70 years ago, our, our, our nation and the world suffered from, from the Holocaust. And the reality was that people knew exactly what's going on. Maybe they didn't have internet and, and, uh, and uh, media like we have now. But in the early 30s, people knew exactly uh, who came in, in, in government in Germany. They knew exactly what's going on. People knew what's going on. They just chose to be numb. And the truth is, like, exactly like you said, my grandmother, they used to live in Berlin. And they were very, very wealthy. My great-grandfather was a banker, was investments. And, and they, they were very, very wealthy in Berlin. They lived the life. You know, my grandmother told me how they had the servants and... Everything she wanted, she had, and she lived literally like a little princess. And in the early 30s, when Hitler and Machimo went up to, to power, people were starting to say, listen, you know, it's not, being, it's not going to be safe here so long, for so long. It's not a good place for us to stay. We're not going to be welcomed here, etc., etc. And everybody was talking about, what, what are you talking about? We're, we know we're so safe here. Everything is good here. And then came 1932 and 1933, and then it passed in 1934, 1935, and then it started becoming a little bit more, uh, a little bit more, the the. Done, yeah. Yes, and my grandmother, exactly like you said, they were lucky enough to to run away from Berlin the night before Kristallnacht, and she was 17. She wasn't a two-year-old that doesn't remember what happened. She was 17, and she told me. Uh, she told me, you know what's the amazing thing? She came to my wedding uh, in America. I got married in New York, and she came to my wedding. It was 11 years ago, almost 12 years ago. She was in her, you know, 80s. Oh, Hashem, she get, got to live a very long life. She passed away when she was 92. And she came to New York. She was in, you know, 82, 83. She made a whole trip just to come to see her grandson getting married. And during the three weeks that she spent in New York, you know, we were traveling, we were walking around. And then she, my grandmother was a very special lady. And she was also, uh, I can't say vulgar with how she talked, but she didn't have a restraint on her mouth. <laughs> and, and, and she was a very special character, an amazing, amazing lady. We'll talk about it in another show, but I, I know that she didn't complete her her journey in this world. She, a piece of her soul got reincarnated in one of my daughters. And it's an amazing story. Maybe we'll have a few minutes to talk about that. I'd love to talk about that, yes. Anyways, when she was at the wedding, we were walking around, and then she told me, she told me, in you know, her words were, do what you need to do in this country and get the hell out of here. That's what she mm -hmm. told me. I'm sorry for the, how I'm saying it, but I, I had to quote her. And when I was looking at her, like, why? She told me, America right now looks like how Germany looked in the early 30s. Everything was good. Everybody had money. We were very comfortable. We were free to be Jewish. We had mezuzahs on the doors. You could walk to shul with a talis on you. Nobody was bothered. Everything was good. But then in the mid-30s, you know, suddenly it started to become a little bit uh, uh, hard because, you know, I couldn't go to the same ballet class with the other girl, with the German girls. Mm -hmm. And then it started that in school, 
I couldn't play with the German kids. And then it started that in school, we were, you know, the classroom was cut in half. The German kids were on the right and the Jews were in the back. And then it started that we couldn't walk on the same side of the sidewalk. And then it started that we, you know, every Jewish uh, store had to write on it that it's a Jew. And she told me it was a couple of years, but it was very slowly crawling in that, you know, we are not so wanted here. And when people came and told us, listen, you got to run away, something's going to happen, the snut case is going to, be, to, 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 to rule this country, she said, nobody believed. And everybody was like, no, it's okay, nothing's going to happen. And very few people got their bags and quietly left. Now, since my grandfather, great-grandfather was very wealthy and very well connected in the right places, one night he's getting a call from somebody, and that somebody on the other side of the line tells him, don't go home tonight. Mm -hmm. So he took it pretty serious. It was already close to 1939. Uh, or it was uh, sorry. It was already in 1939, and he didn't go home that night. That night, uh, I don't remember if it was SS officers or the secret police officers. They came to my grandmother's home looking for him. The next day, he gets another call from a friend who was a high officer in the police, and he told him, "Run away, run away," and hung up the phone. He went home. He packed two or three bags, whatever he can put in the bags, a couple of uh, clothes. You know, they took, that's what's amazing. He took his talis, he took his tefillin, he took his kiddush cup, and the set of the besamim, which I inherited all of these things. I have, I have this kiddush cup that my grandmother gave us for our wedding, and the, the, it's engraved on it, 1839, something like that, from the, you know, it was in the family. They took a few things and they ran away, and that night started Kristallnacht. And they ran away by foot, and they somehow got to England, and from England to Canada, from Canada to Alaska. America didn't let them in, and they somehow ended up in Australia. From being very rich and spoiled and wealthy in Berlin, my great-grandfather started working as a mover, schlepping boxes, and my 17-year-old grandmother, who was a princess, started sewing in you know a local place, making, I don't know, whatever currency they had, or a shilling a day, whatever it was, which was like bobkes, and they were eating like uh, leftover foods overnight. And when she looked back, she told me, yeah, we, we had a, a very hard 10 years getting adjusted to this, you know, country, Australia in the 40s, <laughs> who ever heard of even of, of Australia? And she was like, but our lives were saved. And all the rest of the family got murdered, and we got saved because my father was smart enough to, to listen and not to worry about his money and his property and his business and his, anything that he, they had. She told me how they had this beautiful new car, and who had cars in the, night, in, the, in, in the late 30s? The rich people had cars. You know what it is to have a car in the 30s? So whether it was, I don't remember what it was, some, uh, maybe it was a German make, I don't remember, I, but the fact was that they were very wealthy and she was like, my father was smart enough to say, I'm saving my family. Yes. And the truth is that in our, in our generation, I know thousands of people, half of the people, they're completely numb, they don't even see the danger is hovering over our heads. The rest are just saying, no, but I'm, I'm comfortable here, and I have a job, and I have a home, and I have a nice car, and, and all the things. I'm, I'm very comfortable here, even though the reality is that most people are already getting not comfortable, that Hashem already started in 2007 when the entire world's economy started crashing, which is another sign that Mashiach is coming, because it said right before Mashiach comes, you know, money will no, not going to have any value and all the, the world economies are going to start crashing and the, the and the amazing thing is that actually the Israeli economy is the most stable one in the world <laughs> and and the reality is that most people even physically are not getting comfortable in the last couple of years so the reason why I always bring up the same story with my grandmother is that history repeats itself uh, and a lot of people where they are, they're just very numb. They're just, no, I'm comfortable here. They don't even see or realize that they're not comfortable where they are. 
So even if they have an, a normal job, I've been, I'm been dealing and talking and helping thousands of families to move to Israel. And that's one of the main things that I get. What am I going to do in Israel? What, are, what, what am I going to work there? So first of all, you know, Israel is not a desert. Israel is the, the number one country in the world in high-tech technology, health. There's so much jobs and, and work here. It's so not true that there's no jobs here. That's the first thing. The second thing is, let's look at it in a more negative way for a second. If I have to save my life, it doesn't matter what I'm going to work in, in the land where I'm going to get there. Uh, I have to first save my life. I have to serve, serve, serve my life. And if I can do it in a nice and easy way, let me try to save a little bit of my belongings or, or the little money that I have or anything. But this is looking at it in a, a little bit of a more negative way that, you know, which a lot of people don't like hearing. Ah, oh, you know, you're talking about apocalyptic things and the end of the world and world war. And a lot of people don't like hearing it, even though go to the Internet, open the newspapers, open the TV and just see what's going on in the world. You don't have to be a genius. It's insane. Yeah, you know, just yesterday I, 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 I saw, I like going on the, on the behind the scenes websites, not on the main websites uh, of uh, news, because they beautify things, they show us yeah. what, what they want us to see. But there are real news uh, channels, and they're showing that right now 20, that's what I saw yesterday, 20 countries, a coalition is gathered together, and they're supposedly like making a drill. They're not making a drill. It seems like they're making some biggest drill in history. But the reality is that they're just moving armies closer to where they want. And they're saying it's, it's Saudi Arabia and, you know, some, it's about 20 countries. Mm -hmm. and, they're, and they're preparing an army of 350,000 troops, I think 3,000 jets, thousands of tanks it's this coalition of 20 countries and they're now doing a, bit, a drill and they're saying the biggest drill in the in the in the middle east that there ever happened the reality is that they're not doing a drill they're just moving their army quietly and conveniently yeah. so you don't have to be a genius you know every day a different threat is coming from russia a different threat is coming from iran you don't have to be, you know, I think you have to be very uh, numb <laughs> to not see what's going on in the world. Even if you're looking at the world in, in, the, in, the, in a physical, in physical eyes, with, a, yeah. with very basic, with very basic uh, understanding in world affairs. And a lot of people, you know, are saying, you know, especially when I'm talking about places like in the United States, they're like, oh, okay, so the war's in the Middle East, it's never going to get here to America. That's also yeah. not true. Because America has very big enemies. Yes. And unfortunately, everywhere in the world, when things happen in the world, when big wars start in the world, usually the economies of the countries get affected. And who's to blame? The Jews. The Jews, yeah. are, the Jews are to blame. And everywhere in the world, you look and you point your finger, you'll start seeing unbelievable anti-Semitism. I lived in, in Brooklyn for many, many years. And people who may be walking in the street without a yarmulke or, or a tzitzis or looking religious, they will feel it less. But me walking with a long beard and a black, big black yarmulke, I would constantly get pushed and cursed and spat on. And in the neighborhood where I lived, we had like a local uh, Jewish police, you know, they call it Shmira. I don't know if you have this concept in South Africa, as well, yes. but it's like a, you know, a citizen's patrol and, and they were reporting in the, in the neighborhood where I, li I lived in Brooklyn, they were reporting that every month uh, the, the amount of anti-Semitism acts is doubling every month. And it started with, uh, you know, a little bit of violence and curses, and then it went into, you know, vandalism, and then they went to swastikas on, on sprayed on cars and walls, and then it was uh, beating up uh, youth, and then it went to all sorts of things. And everywhere in the world you see it. In Europe you really see it. I don't know mm -hmm. how it is exactly in South Africa, but when things go down, the Jews are to blame. And any way you look at it, I, I, I can talk on this topic for hours because really that's one of the things that I do the most 
after I get people aroused to love God and start pursuing, <clears throat> I'm sorry, pursuing the Torah, is the urgency of leaving where they are and going to Israel doesn't matter how things are. Mm -hmm. So, literally, I can talk for hours about it if you're looking at it from the biblical uh, part of it, if you're looking at it from the prophetic part of it, what we see in our scripts. If you're looking at, you know, a, a world uh, affairs, what's going on now. If you anywhere you're going to look at it, it's all pointing to the to the same place, to the same point that everybody. When I'm saying everybody, I'm talking about the Jews. Start have to start heading towards Israel. Yes. And the faster you do it, the smoother it's going to be. And the, the fastest you do it, it's going to be much more easier and convenient. And, and today, it's, it's, you know, a lot of people, you know, their argument is, where am I going to go? I don't have family there. My family is back home. And there's so many arguments. The reality is that you can argue on anything. But if one chooses to see the reality as it is, mm -hmm. then they take the, the, the wisdom and the experience of our generation above us, how they, how they were able, the ones that were smart, were able to run away from Europe at the right time. And they didn't stop to think, what about my business? My family's left behind. What am I going to do when I get to the place that I get? People got to America in the early 30s with nothing, with a bag, with a suitcase. And they made it. It was a hard time, and, and the, you, you, there's numerous, if not thousands, of stories of a person who came off the ship in America, and now they're a billionaire. Mm -hmm. Which I'm not saying that you have to get off the ship and become a billionaire, but the point is that, you know, they say, there's a, there's a pasuk that says, Haboteach Hashem chesed The one who trusts Hashem, kindness and charity surrounds him. And the point is, wherever you go, if you have trust in Hashem, doesn't matter where you're going to go, where you're going to land, Hashem will take care of you wherever you are. Hashem is the one who provides you where you are now, and Hashem is going to provide you wherever you're going to be. And if you're lacking the trust in Hashem, then it doesn't really matter. That's a whole different problem if a person is lacking the trust in Hashem, or, or has a disbelief that right now everything that he gets is from Hashem. If somebody thinks that he gets his health, stasens, uh, mm -hmm. uh, anything, their, his home, his car, because of his own acts, that's the biggest mistake one can, can think. The biggest illusion. Yeah. Because ultimately everything comes from Hashem, my health, my sustenance, my job, anywhere. And I literally, I'm not exaggerating, literally helped thousands of families and individuals to do Aliyah in the last couple of years. Oh. And, and I'm in touch with a lot of them, and I'm especially in touch with the ones that hard, have a harder start. And I can tell you that the, it's a minority from the thousands that I know, thousands that just never contacted me because they, you know, and I find out after a year or two, they're fine, they found their place, they found jobs, they kid got, their kids got situated. Very few that I hear from them that are struggling, and you know, the ones that I hear that are struggling were also struggling where they came from. And, this, and the ones, some of them that are struggling are just the, the I'm sorry to say that the spoiled ones that are, that are refusing to go to Ulpan, so they're complaining, I don't know Hebrew. So go to Ulpan, you'll know Hebrew. And all sorts of other things like that. But really, there's so many things in so many areas that really are pointing that it's time that Mashiach is coming. Yeah. And everyone must prepare in the minimum that they can do is at least in a very subtle and calm and, and peaceful way, move themselves. Because when things become a little bit more harder... And the reality is, you, you know, this is, I'm, I'm, for one second, taking Hashem and the Torah out of the picture. Really just open the news and you see that the world is going into a, to a world war. That's how it looks. Every news channel you open, it, it shows that we're, we're going into a, a, a world war. Which, again, I'm not, I'm not uh, predicting or coming to say apocalyptic things, but this is the reality. Unfortunately, that's the reality. Anywhere you, you, any 
a, a news channel you open, you just see. So just by that, seeing that the world Chas Shalom can come into a huge world war, any big any time there's a big war, the Jews are to blame. Doesn't matter where you're going to be, because wars affect the economy. Things you know go down, and who's to blame? The Jews are to blame. Yes. Alone, we we're gonna just go to an, another quick break. Um, uh, but a question that a, a number of listeners, because I've spoken on uh, making Aliyah, take me home, in uh, you know in in my shows, and. Some of the questions that I've had from uh, my beloved listeners is the question of what the Lubavitcher Rebbe predicted in terms of that you know, South Africa is going to be fine. I don't know what he said about America, uh, but that the, so there, there's various takes on um, you know people's comfort zones and the, the comfort that they take in that. So if you can just explain that a little bit more as soon as we come back from the break. Sure. If you haven't entered one of the many competitions or giveaways on Chai FM, you definitely should. Why? Why? Because of our 90-day prize policy, it means that more people get to win more often. According to Applied Logic, the more winners we have, the greater your chances of winning. winning, winning. So listen up for the next prize. It could be yours. 101.9 IFL. 101.9 megahertz of prizes. He is a rabbi, spiritual adventurer, teacher, speaker, writer, and blogger. He is proudly Jewish. He is Rabbi Ari Shishler, and he's exclusive to Chai FM. Join Rabbi Ari Shishler for some fresh thinking every Thursday from 2 to 3 p.m. 101.9 Chai FM, 101.9 megahertz of power. The best part of your day, at the heart of your community. All the talk, all the music, all the news. Chai FM. Good morning and welcome to the Cabana Show, Body, Mind and Soul of Imona. And I've got the privilege this morning of speaking to Rabbi Mun Anava, who uh, is well known to many of our listeners from uh, sharing his many stories of many, many insights and his near-death experience. And this morning we are speaking about making Aliyah. And just the, the the kind of urgency that you know, be, I, I, you know, get the sense that we've been poked and poked and poked. Things are getting more and more uncomfortable. But as you say, history keeps repeating itself, and people will find excuses in uh, you know in order to keep a, a so-called comfort zone going. Whether it's something physical, but spiritually, the, there must be also a, a huge discomfort. Because the soul wants to be in Israel. Yes, definitely. So in regards so, to your to your question, oh, yes. sorry, go ahead. Mm. So the, so yes. So the question that I've had many times, and anybody wants to ask Alon any questions, the on air SMS number is three four five one nine. The on air email is on air at hyphen dot com. Any phone, anybody want to phone in? Alon is a wealth a wealth of information and insight. So it's 074-654-7335. So Alon, so, we, so just before the break, I just asked the question about the Lubavitcher Rebbe and his brocha for South Africa yes. in terms of that everything will be okay till Mashiach comes. You know, you kind of answered the question. You said, till Mashiach comes. <laughs> So, so we, we, we know already Mashiach is coming, so, you know, that's where the line is drawn. Uh, the, the thing is that, you know, there's, there's endless amount of, 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 uh, 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 of uh, praises to say about the Lubavitch Rebbe. And the thing, the, the thing is that we know that for years his his life uh, his life uh, work was, was to prepare to to, um, to the Jews to thinking about Mashiach to promoting to uh, absolutely um, uh, making it happen. <laughs> 
Um, or do we have Alon back on the line? Yes. Alon? Yes, back on the line. Do we have Alon back on the line? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, I don't know if you heard my old Russia there. No, uh, I got no. cut off uh, <laughs> no, right when I started. Right yeah, so I was just speaking about the Lubavitcher Rebbe and his passion from, from his, you know, as he took the, the mantle uh, of bringing Mashiach. So, um, it's correct. His life journey, life journey was to, was to, to promote and to prepare, prepare the world for the coming of Mashiach. Mashiach. Yeah. That, that, that was his, his, his main effort. Besides getting Jews closer to God and spreading the word of the Torah, and his main mission was to prepare the world for the coming of Mashiach. He literally did the, the preparation yeah. From the second that he became a uh, Rebbe in 1951 till the last day of, of his life in this world, his main effort was to bring Mashiach. One of his main efforts, by the way, for many people who don't know, is to inhabit it, which I don't know if it's the right, right word to say it, but pushing people to Israel. Yeah. From the 50s, he already was sending emissaries, going, you know, I live in Tzfat now. The story was that the second that Israel was declared, he sent uh, rabbis to go to Tzfat to take possession of, of certain synagogues. Uh, one of the synagogues is the one where, where I pray. It's called the Tzemach Tzedek, who's like a, it's about a, a two, three hundred year synagogue that survived the earthquake, and they found their Torah scrolls from that time. He, he's, one of his main missions was also to make sure that Israel is uh, becoming populated and, and, uh, and uh, the growth of Israel, and he was, I think, one of the only, if not the main ones, of the world leaders, the rabbinical leaders, were, that was always supporting Israel. They always met with the Israeli officials. He was constantly, uh, you know, promoting Israel. There's not, there's not enough time to say, you know, praises about him. But yes, he did give a bracha to South Africa. He gave a bracha to America too. He gave a bracha everywhere. Because if, if it wouldn't have a bracha, you know, uh, I, I, it says that tzaddik gozer, la kadosh buchu mekayem, the tzaddik says something and the kadosh buchu does it. He gave brachas so we will have the koach, the power to survive the galut, the, the exile. And it's compared to, to Yosef a tzaddik. In the history of, of, our, of our Torah, Yosef went down to Mitzrayim and he became the king. And then, uh, you know, the whole story. And he ordered, you know, his father, Yaakov, Jacob, made him, he made him swear that he will take him up to Eretz Israel to be buried in the, in the Marat HaMachpelah in Hebron. Yosef did not do that. Yosef says, no, you're going to bury me in Mitzrayim, and when you're ready to leave, you take my coffin with my bones. And we see that right when they left Mitzrayim, Moshe Rabbeinu went to take the bones of Yosef. And one of the reasons for that is because Yosef said, I'm going to be staying in exile with my kids till the last one leaves, so I can provide... A, a faith that I can provide them spiritual guidance and spiritual uh, uh, belief and when they're ready to leave you can take my body I'm not going to be spoiled and be buried in, in Eretz Israel I'm going to be buried in exile to be with you till the last day we're here and you know many people approached the Rebbe and they told him how come you're not moving to Israel isn't it a mitzvah to be in Israel don't you want to be you know living in Israel and he said, you know, uh, a captain is not deserting a, a sinking ship. And I'm staying here till the last Jew is going to be in, in exile. So, since we're little on time, I'm, I'm just going to get straight to the point. The point was that the Rebbe gave a bracha to all the Jews around the world to be safe till Mashiach comes. But on the other hand, can you imagine... Somebody asked me that not too long ago in a lecture because it was an in a Chabad uh, show and I was you know, constantly talking about Israel, Israel, go to Israel. And one young lady told me, <clears throat> yeah, but the Rebbe said uh, exactly like you said, but here in America and we're safe and, and uh, it's kind of con con contradicting what the Rebbe said. And I, and I told her, listen, what would happen if 20 years ago the Rebbe would say, listen, in 2016, 
it's going to get very, very bad. What would we do? First of all, everybody will fall into despair because it means that we have to wait another 20 years for the Mashiach to come. <laughs> That's first of all. Second of all, can you imagine the havoc, the, the, what's going to happen if, they would, if we would have such a, a promise? So I told her, first of all, the Rebbe would never put into us, you know, the, this uh, despair of saying, oh yeah, you have to wait another 30 years before Mashiach comes. The Rebbe kept saying, we want Mashiach now. We don't want, to want it in 30 years. More than that, you know, a lot of the times, tzaddikim, righteous men, they know exactly Hashem's plan, but they can't say it, they can't reveal it, they can't intervene in what's going on. Which you can see proof to that, what, there weren't tzaddikim at the, at the time of the Holocaust that were, they were able to get up and say, listen, this is about to happen, run away. There were many tzaddikim at the time of the Holocaust, even before the Holocaust, you know, in Europe, the Chafetz Chaim, who kept saying, you know, you know, he, he was actually saying in a very subtle way, what, he didn't know there's going to be a Holocaust? It says in the Torah it's going to be a Holocaust. So at the time of the, of the Holocaust, there were gr huge tzaddikim, real righteous tzaddikim, that some of them got murdered in the Holocaust, but they didn't know what's going on. Of course they knew, they're just not allowed to intervene in Hashem's plan. So sometimes a tzaddik knows exactly what's going to happen, and since he, he can't intervene, the, little, the minimum that he can do is says, okay, I'm going to give you a bracha. The two it happens, you're going to be safe. But, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people, they, they take words of the righteous people and they distort them or they understand them how they want to understand them. But the reality is that the bracha that, they, <clears throat> that the Rebbe gave to all the Jews around the world is yes, that they're going to be saved, and they're going to be safe till Mashiach comes. But when Mashiach comes, we don't know how it's going to happen. It can happen in a very safe and quiet way, and it can happen in a not nice way. We don't know. It depends on, on the merits of the Jews. And more than that, <clears throat> we do have a promise from the Torah, and we say it every time that we take the Torah scroll out, and we say, this, this is a verse from the Torah, which means that you are the ones, the ones who are, are uh, uh, glued themselves to Hashem, they're clamped onto Hashem, will be saved. <clears throat> and David HaMelech says in the, in the book of Tehillim, A thousand will fall on one side, ten thousand will fall on the other side, and nothing will come to you. So we do have promises from the Torah, that if you are 100% connected to Hashem, you'll be safe. But unfortunately, even in the time of the Torah, we saw that even the ones who are connected to Hashem, 100%, they weren't safe, and they were also murdered. Because we don't know the, 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 what's going on in the heavenly courts. We don't know whose time to go, who's not time to go. More than that, we don't even know, you know, one, anyone, nobody can come and say, oh, I'm 100% observant. I, I'm, I, you know, I can't think that anyone can come and say I'm 100% observant. We, we strive to become in, uh, as close as possible. But chas v'shalom, when a person is not 100% observant, that he's not going under the promise of the Torah that he's going to be okay. So, to go back to, 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 to the question, yes, the Rebbe gave a bracha, then the bracha works. Because up until now, most of the Jews around the world are safe. But the reality is that the Rebbe says it's still the coming of Mashiach. You kind of answered the question uh, with how you presented the, the, the question. Till Mashiach comes. So and we know. Every single person I speak to are saying that uh, we are living in Mashiach. It, it, it's right here. It's right under our noses. Yeah. And th that's, that's my truth. And I mean, I don't know much. But it's it, it's a it's a very very strong feeling. It's it it uh, it's just a knowing that we are Mashiach is right here, and it, even if we start to behave in that way, you, in uh, hundreds of years ago they used to have a packed suitcase. They had their Shabbos suit, yeah. and I dress my best every single day because I am waiting to see Mashiach. I really believe it. Yes. And um, 
that to me that's a that's a truth so the sooner we all get to Eretz Israel and live that truth because it is the only truth and uh, uh, fulfill that prophecy of all the Jews returning to Israel um, it's uh, there, there's a couple of prophecies that uh, still need to be fulfilled but maybe they don't need to be fulfilled well, maybe not... just uh, uh, all of us packing up and going yeah. <clears throat> well, you know you I just want to say one thing about the prophecies we know that a bad prophecy can always be cancelled and that's why a lot of people, you know, a good prophecy must happen. But a bad prophecy can be can be cancelled or annulled or reduced. Yes. Yes. And and it's very important to take that to consideration. But exactly like you're saying, you know, you, you literally can see that we're in the, 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 the Mashiach is in the doorstep. And it can happen any second. Yes. And, you know, a lot of people ask me, yeah, you know, there are many people, including the Rebbe, who said that the Mashiach is going to come, you know, with with kindness, and we're not mm. going to have to suffer the big war, that the Holocaust was already the big war. And, you know, a lot of people, when they tell me that, I tell them, listen, let's assume that right now Mashiach comes in a very nice and peaceful way. Mm. You know what a waiting list is going to be for flights <laughs> to fly into Israel? There's not enough planes in the world to fly six, seven million people from all around the world into Israel. There's not enough runways, you know, physically. Planes can only land once a minute, once every five minutes. How are they going to bring millions of people? So what, you're going to come to Israel three months, three months after Mashiach comes? In the meantime, you're missing the party. And then you land in Israel, you know, go find where to live. Go fi you know, how are you going to settle? You know, some people think that Mashiach is going to come, we're going to wake up into Wonderland. It doesn't work like that. Mashiach is going to come into the same world. It says, Olam Kiminago Noeg. The world is going to be exactly the same in the beginning. Later on, the world will shift to become a much different world. But in the beginning, the world will be the same. So some people say, oh, yeah, we're going to be flying on clouds. You know, you kind of have to be with your feet on the ground and not accept, you know, not, not wait for the clouds to come and take you or the eagles. You're going to come on planes. And, you know, I, don't, I want that the second Mashiach comes, that I can get into my car and go to Jerusalem and see the first sacrifice being given in, in, in the Beit HaMikdash. Why should I wait three months on a waiting list to, yeah. to, to get on a plane? Not yeah. to talk about that, you know, doing a move to such a, a, such a big move, it takes a few months till you find a place to live and a job and schools for the kids. And so you want to be settled in. You don't want to uh, uh, come last minute. Yes. So Although we've run out of time. I can't believe it. I can't believe how the time just flies when I speak to you. I enjoy it so much. And the listeners, uh, bless them, bless my beloved listeners, that there's a number of um, statements and um, uh, not so many questions as you know, people making observations about their own lives. And I'm really, really sorry that I can't get to them to um, uh, acknowledge I'm just acknowledging them and thank you so much for responding and um, thank you thank you thank you Alon and I really um, have enjoyed this hour with our beloved listeners and that we have the most beautiful Wednesday the most beautiful rest of the week and the most beautiful Shabbos, and that you have a very, very peaceful time in Sfas, and I'm so grateful to you. Thank you, Aldon. My pleasure. Have a beautiful okay. week. A frequency like no other. 101.9 High FM. Albert Einstein once said that only a life lived for others is a life worthwhile. So, Chai FM brings you the Tikkun Olam Show. Join us every Wednesday at midday as we profile the organizations working to fix the world. That's the Tikkun Olam Show, Wednesdays at 12 midday. We first met last year. It was love at first sight. I mean